welcome to Financial Insider Weekly. I'm your host, Michael Gray. My guest today is Lori Graymont, and Lori is the Chief Executive Officer at Summit Assets Group. Lori has been in the real estate investment area for over 20 years. She started when she was three. <laughs> anyway. She actually started out as a teenager helping mom and dad out, uh, uh, rehabilitating homes. And her husband was jealous of her because he, she had better tools than he did. And so he decided to get married so that he could use her tools. <laughs> That's what she told me anyway. Um, anyway, you, when you look at Lori, you can understand that he married for, for more than the tools. Uh, anyway, uh, Lori is a very savvy person when it comes to uh, real estate investment. Uh, she's appeared as a host on this, uh, not as a host, I've been the host. She's been a guest on this show before and I hope to have her come again because she always has something uh, great to, uh, to share with us, good insights. Um, Summit Assets Group uh, is involved in, uh, in assisting clients, uh, to get involved in real estate investment. They do coaching. Uh, they also have turnkey systems to, for do-it-yourselfers and, uh, and so forth. We'll be talking a little bit along the way of some of the ways that they, they help people out. Um, but anyway, um, you may want to visit uh, Lori's website uh, that we've got in the contact information and, and get in touch with her if you would like to get some help uh, in getting involved in real estate investing. But today we're going to be talking about sort of a new area. Uh, so in the past we've talked about uh, buying bulk foreclosed properties and there's been some changes that have been happening in the marketplace that we're going to be talking about. Uh, but Lori has been especially excited about what's been going on in Atlanta. So I guess we're going to be talking about uh, the advantages and disadvantages of investing in real estate in the Atlanta, Georgia area and uh, because she's got a lot of good experience and insight there. Lori, thanks so much for joining me today. Michael, thank you for the opportunity. Yeah, it's a real pleasure. All right, so I, I guess I'm going to start with uh, the thing in general. So, what happened? You, you've been, again, working in this uh, area of uh, the bank foreclosed properties uh, for the last couple of years. Mm -hmm. And so, and now it's, your business has sort of morphed to uh, focusing on investing in the Atlanta area and not necessarily the foreclosed property. So maybe you can talk a little bit about sure. why you've made this sort of a change. Sure. So. When we first started out, we were buying foreclosures. We'd buy them in bulk, so like 10 properties at a time. And these were properties the banks could not sell on the MLS, so they're very distressed and came with many different problems. But we would sell or finance them out to individuals who could not qualify for bank uh, financing. So when we say so, basically the seller was in fact carrying the, the mortgage on the property. Yes, so, so we would carry the mortgage. So someone would put $500 down and pay us $400 oh. a month and we oh, would okay. carry it for them. Oh. And then when they paid us off, they'd get the deed. I see. And what we were finding is that we were managing properties in 43 different cities, 15 different states, regulations, rules, tax Major returns, headaches. like this big, yes. you know, it, it just turned into being more of a management headache than it was a profit making um, venture. Uh -huh. And we looked at our portfolio and we had quite a few properties that were in the Georgia market. And so we started doing our research on the market. Um, I'm an avid investor in Texas. I love Texas for cash flow. And what I found out is that the Atlanta market was very similar to the Texas market with one exception, lower taxes. Mm -hmm. But it's landlord friendly and um, very easy to do business in. So when we say lower taxes, we mean property taxes. Yes, because, lower property taxes. Because Texas doesn't have income taxes, 
Georgia does have some income taxes, yeah. so we'll, we'll talk a little bit about that as we go along. But. Yes. Yeah, so that means more cash flow. You uh -huh. know, so if I'm charging rent and I don't have to pay as much in my property taxes, I get more cash flow on the bottom line. Uh -huh. And so we just started um, testing it out a couple years ago with our own properties, making them into rentals and seeing if the tenants were stable and if the market was stable. And we found uh, a very good, solid market. Great, okay. Um, so what do you think is attractive about the Atlanta market? So Atlanta, surprisingly, is a very large metropolitan. It's the eighth largest MSA. And if you think about the Southeast United States. Excuse me, what's an MSA? MSA is Metropolitan Statistical Area. Okay. Um, it's a big city. Very big city. <laughs> Over four million people live in the Atlanta market, and it's not constrained by any geographical boundaries. Mm -hmm. And so it continues to attract people, they continue to build, it continues to feed on itself. And it's based on transportation, finance, education. It has a very diverse economy, and technology is moving in there. In the upper part of the Atlanta market, in like Alpharetta and Roswell, they're starting to build a technology center that's gonna be rivaling Austin, Texas. You know, we're not quite, I mean, it's hard to rival Silicon yeah, Valley, but right. you know, if you go outside this area, there's very few markets. There's Charlotte, North Carolina, Austin, Texas, and now Atlanta's coming up in that area. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So they're creating jobs. Okay. Um, so, what kind of properties are you looking at here? What sort of, I guess, I, I think a key issue is what does it cost to get into this marketplace? Okay. So, if you remember back when we were doing our bulk REOs, we would buy an entire package, like 10 properties, for $100,000. Yes. Um, you're not going to get that kind of deal. Okay. okay, so we're, we're paying more than 10000 a house. But you can get a decent house, three bedroom, two bath, 1,500 square feet for $50,000. Yeah. Maybe, maybe 60000 prices are going up. You haven't seen prices like that here since about 1977, I don't think. So. It's crazy. Yeah. <laughs> and so if you look at the Atlanta market, the, the entire market, the median rent is $1,146. So one thousand one hundred forty-six dollars a month, and so that that's about twelve thousand, almost thirteen thousand dollars a year. Yes. So what we just decided to do is find a place in the Atlanta market that was just under the median income or median rent, because that's where the largest population of renters would be. But we didn't want to go in the hood. Yeah. You know, because the rough that, areas. Yeah. The rough areas, because then you're having a hard time collecting rent. You have tenant turnover and all of that. You're afraid to go collect the rent. <laughs> <laughs> you might have to have a friend come with you to collect it. You know. A great big friend. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. And so um, we looked at the suburbs and we went out into some of the suburbs and found that we could get rents in the $900 range in these fifty and $60,000 homes. Okay, so $900 a month again, so about $10,000 a year. Yes. $10,000 a year on 50000 that's 20%, isn't that is. it? That is. That is. That's and kind of like, that's unheard of. It is, and it's low risk because these homes are rehabbed. You know, you're not buying the home in the, the state that we would buy them in where, you know, it's been sitting empty for two years. Instead, you're buying it already rehabbed in the 50000 range. and It's you're just like, we can't even imagine that here. No. Because, no. I mean, you know, here you buy a home like that and it's $750,000, $800,000. Exactly. So, um, it, it's hard to even comprehend uh, as a Silicon Valley person that, that something like this could even possibly exist. Exactly. You know, so many people come to me and they say, you know, I want to figure out how I can build up $10,000 a month passive income. And in their mindset, they're thinking they're having to buy a $400,000, $500,000 house to get $1,500 cash flow. Yeah. Because that's what we're, we're taught here in the Bay Area. Or maybe they go over to like a Fresno area and they're paying 250000 for that 1200 cash flow. But they're never going to make it 
to the, the $10,000 a month that they want unless they have a large fortune to put into the housing. And so it really doesn't make sense to stay in California, but everybody's afraid to leave the state of California. And most of my investing career for the past 25 years has been outside the state. Wow. All right. <clears throat> well, we're thinking now, I'm in California, Georgia. Gee, that's an awful long way. So first, well, uh, what do you do about management of this property? Mm -hmm. and, and what does that cost? Yeah. So y when you own a property, whether it's in your backyard or it's in Georgia, you need somebody to manage it. Yes. And in the state of California, I do not recommend people manage their own properties because the laws are towards the tenant. Yes. And if you as an owner make a mistake, you could end up having a tenant not pay you rent for a year. Mm -hmm. So you need to hire a professional property manager. It's no different when you go out of the state. You hire a professional property manager and you're going to require certain things of that property manager. You want a manager that has real estate investing experience because if they've invested, they know that the way you make money is manage the property well. You keep the tenant in that property. Every time a tenant moves out, you have to pay for refixing that property and that's where the major expense comes in. So working with a good property manager that keeps your tenants in there and has little programs to incent the tenants to stay there is the type of property manager you wanna work with. And so how do you find people like that? <laughs> you interview people. You know, don't assume the first person you talk to is going to be the right person. You ask for references. You talk to the, the people. Talk to a couple tenants even. Um, but usually if you go to NARPM, National Association of Property Managers, out on the internet you can find a list of property managers. Or you ask people who are already investing in that area. Who's your property manager? Are you happy? Do they spend your money wisely? Those are the kind of questions you want to be asking. So uh, what sort of, uh, you know, you're getting 900 a month rent. Yes. How, what sort of a cut of that is the property manager getting? Usually 10%. Okay. You know, and it's interesting. Whenever you find a new investor, they always want to negotiate that 10% down to 7 or 8 that isn't where your cost is. I mean, pay your manager well to that 10%. They're the one that's taking care of your property. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> if you don't pay them well there, then they're gonna try to find you more tenants because usually there's a lease up fee. You know, when they uh -huh. put a tenant in, they take that first month's rent. Yeah. Do you want them to keep doing that in order to keep their operations going? Or yeah. do you wanna pay them the 10%? You're gonna be much better off paying them the 10%. Now, I take it, especially for people that are new in this area, you help sometimes to turnkey this a little bit and help them to contact yes. managers that you know? So we actually have our own management that we manage our own properties and we have references to other managers in the Atlanta market. And so we can either manage it or we can turn them into other referrals, you know, other okay. people that we work with. All right. Now, I'm thinking about buying a property in Atlanta. Oh my gosh. Yeah. I mean, where do I even start? How do I find pr properties and then what should I be thinking about when I'm thinking about okay, well maybe I'd be interested in this property here. What are some of the, th the things that I need to be aware of to avoid like stubbing my toe big time? Yeah. So of course I'm going to say the first thing you do is contact us because <laughs> we've already been through the process for a couple of years. Uh -huh. But when you're looking in a new market, you always want to understand what are the job drivers? What, what's going to be the employment base of the people renting your home? Is it a stable industry? So you're going to look at those kind of things. Then when you're picking out a house, you kind of want to go with a three bedroom, two bath or a four bedroom, two bath. And you want the house to be normal to the neighborhood. In other words, you don't want to be buying the five bedroom, two bath in the three bedroom, two bath neighborhood. Mm -hmm. um, not, not the mansion in the, with the little homes around. Exactly. So you want to- Or the other way around. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You don't want the two bedroom, one bath in yeah. the a five, three yeah. area. So you kind of want it to be normal. You want it to fit in. You want it to be in a neighborhood setting so that people are driving by because 90% of your renters come from drive by traffic. Um, and you're going to want to make sure that you have a good property inspector that mm -hmm. can inspect the property for you because they need to be your eyes on the ground. 
Okay, you and I in the past have talked about that sometimes there are liens and other things that you need to be aware of that may not even be, they may not show up in a title. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Maybe you could talk about that for a few minutes and does that apply in this Atlanta area? So when we were buying our bulk homes, uh, some of the states send the sewer bill, the gas bill, the garbage bill, along with the house rather than with the tenant. And some of these things don't show up until you've owned it for a year or two and all of a sudden you get the bill in the mail. This is not the case in Georgia and that's kind of why we like it is because it stays with the person who racked up the bill. You oh, know, it's that's kind of like, good news. It's called personal responsibility. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. And so, you know, the only thing that would come up is if there's property taxes that are unpaid. But because we encourage all of our buyers to close through a regular escrow, it's an attorney state, we close through escrow with an attorney, then those would be discovered before they buy it. Okay. So again, when we talk about a $60,000, $50,000 threshold, mm -hmm. this sounds like I mean, well, a lot of us aren't, aren't walking around with sixty to fifty thousand dollars around in our in our pocket or even in our bank account, but we may have access to funds in other ways. So, for example, um, retirement accounts. Exactly. And one of the things is that my concern is, and if you watch some of the, again our past episodes of the show, we talk a little bit about investing using retirement accounts uh, in real estate. But I thought you and I would talk about it for just a moment here. An advantage here is that you don't need to use leverage. And, it, and your problems with the complications for investing in retirement accounts starts when you, when you have to borrow to do it. Mm -hmm. so, um, so are you seeing that? Or are people uh, investing through the retirement accounts uh, for this type of an investment? Or? Okay, so about 90% of my clients buy these homes with cash. Mm -hmm. Some are seeking leverage and obtaining that. Yeah. But most of them figure, let's just buy it cash. The, the returns are so good. Now, out of that, about 38% are using their IRAs or 401ks. They're borrowing the money from a 401k, and they're using that to invest. And so it makes a great option for people, if that's where the money is, to get into an investment like this because it's completely managed for them, and all the proceeds, the rents, would go back into their IRA. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, may as well throw this one out. If you're thinking about buying a property back there, do you think it's worth a trip? I do. I absolutely do. And you know, we um, we encourage our buyers to go back. At this point, we haven't had anybody go back because we provide them enough, you know, pictures and they trust us. But absolutely, there's nothing that would stop me from encouraging somebody to go take a look and. But I always say, look at it through the eyes of people there. Mm -hmm. You know, here it's summer, it doesn't rain. There, it rains every couple of days. <laughs> so you're kind of going into a, a humid rainforest. Yes, it's and a really different climate It's back a completely there. different climate. There are trees everywhere. So no matter where you drive, it's gonna feel like you're in a forest and it's gonna feel rural. But yeah. it's not rural. I mean, just because you can't see across the valley and see all the homes that are there. Like I said, there's four million people in the city. That's a lot of people. Yes. So. Uh, you know, I can appreciate that. Okay, um, so maybe you can talk a little bit about the, how the property taxes work there. So here in California, what we've got like 1% of mm -hmm. uh, the value of, of uh, some people say like a 1.1% benchmark because there's some other little local taxes that apply and so forth. How does the tax system work there? And, and here we got this reassessment game and, and so on. Can you tell us anything about how it works there? Sure. There's different counties, and some counties even have city taxes. So I'm talking in generalization based on just generally. Yeah. yeah. Um, but it's based on market value of the properties, and it's based on last year's market value. So if you're paying a 2012 tax bill, it's based on the 2011 value of the property. It's the value the assessor's office gives it, which is more than what the market is saying it's worth right now. Mm -hmm. um, the taxes are typically about 1%, and sometimes there's a city tax that goes on too, and then it might be 1.5%. So on a, 
fifty thousand dollar house, no, so we could be six hundred bucks, exactly. five hundred, six hundred, five or six hundred dollars oh for property gosh. taxes for the entire year. Yeah. <laughs> well, gee, I mean, mine's I think even more than that, and I've been in my home since nineteen seventy eight. So, <laughs> <laughs> but mine's pretty low uh, yes. compared to a lot of other people. Yes, and they do have a tax appeals office uh, you know some of the homes that we're buying the taxes are showing eleven $1 hundred dollars like one thousand one hundred dollars on a fifty thousand dollar house because they're still using a value of a hundred and fifty thousand which these houses haven't been a hundred and fifty thousand since 2009 yeah and so you would have to appeal that and they have a, a way to appeal and get the the correct value okay so what about financing for people who want to get into these homes what's available in that way so with this whole banking thing, financing has become more difficult. We have the Frank Dodd Act and the SAFE Act, and they require predatory lending to end up reporting different things and paying different fees. And what that means is it's hard for the banks to write a loan for anything under 100000 because usually they charge one point to write the loan. Well, then that becomes predatory lending because the loan is so little, but the fee ends mm -hmm. up being higher. Mm -hmm. So we found some sources that will allow lending on 30,000 or more for a loan. And the interest rate is about a half a point higher than your market interest rate. So we're talking four and a half percent maybe. Mm -hmm. And you have to pay two points because one of those points goes to the government for the predatory lending. Oh dear. But two points on 50,000, that's is, cheap. Yeah. Now is this, um, is it bank financing? It yes. is. It's, oh. it's the typical Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac kind of financing where you do need to have a job, you need to have reserves and qualify for it. So if you fit the sugar cube that the banks have created for lending, you can have a loan there. Okay. Now we also have found some sources for people that I would call private lending. We mm -hmm. have individuals who have IRA funds that they want to loan yeah. on these homes and they loan it at 50% loan to value at a 10% interest rate. And people like it because it's 10% interest only, so you're talking $200 a month uh -huh. out of your 900 and it allows them to buy two homes instead of one. I see. Um, okay. Now, I'm going to try to rent this place. I'm here. That's it. Okay. Well, that's why you've got a property manager. Mm -hmm. So, what's the what's the process like for renting a home? The first thing I need to advise investors is that not all property managers are leasing agents. Somebody who manages well is not necessarily a good salesperson. And you want a leasing agent that can sell your property to the tenant. So make sure whoever you're working with has wonderful leasing agents or you're going to be sitting vacant for a long time. Mm -hmm. The house needs to be cleaned, you know, it needs to smell good, it needs to have good lights, and then you would have ads running everywhere like Craigslist back page and signs in the yard. Mm -hmm. Now, in our case, when we go ahead and we buy a house, the minute we buy the house, we fix up the front yard, we give it beautiful curb appeal, and we put our rental sign out while we're working on the house. Because a lot of people that live in that neighborhood know somebody who wants to move in, and so they've been waiting for somebody to buy this property from the bank. Yeah, so that's what I, I was thinking. I mean, I remember when I sold my first house, and frankly, I worked with real estate agents and everything else. And you know, I <clears throat> I'd already bought my replacement home. Yeah, I had to move this sucker. <laughs> <laughs> and so anyway, uh, I had a friend who was a real estate agent, and you know, we put on multiple listing service and all this mm -hmm. other stuff. And oh my goodness, um, well let's just say we had a yeah you know, activity. We had people that toured the place we had open houses we did all kinds of things and we weren't selling this house oh no so finally I, I bought this book on how to sell a home I didn't buy it I was gonna check it out at the library is at San Jose State or I got it at San Jose State I guess I was working on my master's degree at the time this guy said don't buy a you know a nice sign make your own sign yes. use color crayons <laughs> <laughs> you know, you, you just, just you know, make it look real sloppy and homemade, and just put this thing in front of your house and see what happens. 
And so sort of that's what we did. And mm -hmm. then we had this family that stopped in front of our home. Yes. And they were visiting a relative around the corner. And so they saw our place and we lucked out and they fell in love with it. And so, you know, sometimes it's not necessarily the real professional exactly. uh, way that works. You know, uh, the, the, the slick, because it's, sometimes that scares people off. Well, it absolutely does. And when we were doing our um, bulk REOs, we would always handwrite our signs. And I'm kind of funny with my signs when I have my leasing agents. I have two wonderful leasing agents but I have both of them put their own individual signs in my yard. So one says ABC company call Danielle and the other one says CDF company call Adam. Two different companies, but it draws attention to it and it's not what people typically see. And we get our properties rented very quickly. Okay, we just have you know maybe two and a half minutes left or okay. so. So I think what I'm gonna let you do is, if, you know, maybe if you have some key thoughts uh, that you want to throw out here as we wind this thing up, we'll give you a chance to do that. Okay. Say about a minute now. <laughs> okay. So the biggest thing is we live here in Silicon Valley and we are so technology driven that we trust the truth in the internet. The internet is not truthful. Mm -hmm. Okay. So I had once found a property that was sitting um, right next to water for $15,000 and I thought it was awesome. But the more I dug into it, the more I realized that this house no longer existed, even though the pictures were on the internet and it was a beautiful house with a nice flower out front, that house had disappeared in the floods of Katrina. Oh my gosh. Okay, so my point of this is if you're looking to buy property out of state, make sure you do your due diligence. Make sure you work with a team that you can trust. Make sure you have somebody verify what you're really seeing and don't trust everything that you see on the internet because it's just put up there by humans and it's not always accurate. So that's why I'm thinking it may be a good idea to visit yourself, mm -hmm. or at least if you know somebody, maybe you've got a relative that's exactly. close to Atlanta that can just sort of swing by and take a look at this place. And what does it really look like? What does it look like on the inside? Maybe the outside looks great and there's nothing on the inside. You know, <laughs> and, and exactly, exactly. And that's where, you know, certified property inspectors are really good. If you find a certified property inspector and you ask them to go do an inspection on the property, they're gonna take hundreds of pictures for you. They can take pictures of the neighborhood, they can take pictures of the house. They can give you a personal opinion of how they felt when they were there. Did they feel scared because everybody was staring at them or was it a, a ghost neighborhood maybe the house next door was burnt down these are things that eyes on the ground need to see whether it's your eyes or somebody you can trust okay folks we're all out of time so anyway I uh, hope we've given you some things to think about uh, maybe you're sharing uh, catching some of uh, Lori's excitement about the Atlanta market I'd like to find out more about it uh, anyway we'll see you next time on Financial Insider Weekly